Hello Internet, today we have another done-in-one graphic novel video for you guys. It's a great book you can read in one sitting, and interestingly enough, it's a sequel to a very popular movie. Check out our Patreon so you can join the ranks of these amazing people. Special shout out to Bruce Templeton, Barrel Berries, Monster Montgomery, and Leonard Green. I would have said Doomfella, but somebody went ghost on us. Okay, let's get this thing started. Y'all know this movie. Django Unchained is Quentin Tarantino's seventh film. Django Unchained was a hit both critically and financially, earning more money than any other Tarantino movie to date. Clearly, people loved it. Well, not everybody. And I love it too. I love everything about it, including that it's the most heroic movie Tarantino's ever made. The other two movies with pathos-driven traditional protagonists are Jackie Brown and Kill Bill, but while Jackie is motivated by survival, and Beatrix is motivated by revenge, Django is motivated by love. Driven by love, Django makes an incredible transformation from slave to the fastest gun in the South, and what feels like the origin story for a long-standing serialized Western hero, setting him up for many more adventures. But Tarantino seems like he'd always rather create new characters than return to old ones. We're probably not going to see a Django sequel on the silver screen. Fortunately for us, Tarantino loves comic books. Reggie Hudlin, filmmaker and one-time Black Panther writer, was a producer on Django Unchained and is good buds with Nick Barucci, the founder of Dynamite Entertainment, a comic book publisher who had garnered critical acclaim from its relaunching of classic pulp heroes, like the Green Hornet, Lone Ranger, and El Zorro. Barucci pitched the crossover idea to Hudlin, Hudlin to Tarantino, and Tarantino loved the idea. What he was really into was taking the most famous fictional Mexican Western hero and putting him together with one of the most famous black Western heroes. Plus, they both have names that end in O, so it was meant to be. Tarantino loves comics, but he doesn't write them. After Matt Wagner's recent stellar run with the Zorro character, it was clear to all, including Tarantino, that he was the only man for the scripting job. A consummate and prolific comic book creator, who in addition to his influential original books, Mage and Grendel, has left an indelible mark on long-standing characters like the Green Hornet, Batman, the Spirit, the Shadow, and the Sandman. No, not that one. The cool one. Together, Tarantino and Wagner hashed out a crossover that made sense for both characters, with Django out west for the first time, and a Diego de la Vega getting on in years, facing down a villain straight out of bizarro American history. Add Esteve Pol's seasoned Western artwork, Brandon Wagner's bold and emotional colors, and Simon Bolin's simple but smart lettering, and what you get is a solid, exciting Western that pays respect to the Zorro mythos while also operating as the Django sequel you never knew you always wanted. Django Zorro takes place in Arizona, about a year after the events of Django Unchained. De La Vega is in the state on business, and so is Django. Blowing up plantations gets people's attention. So, Django has left Hildy in Philadelphia, while he hides out west until things calm down. In the meantime, he's still bounty hunting, and De La Vega's exuberant stagecoach presents the perfect bait for his bounty. After meeting De La Vega and protecting him from his quarry, De La Vega offers to hire Django as a bodyguard before he meets Gurko Zagreda Langdon, the Archduke of Arizona, a man who has gone to considerable lengths to falsify his claim to the territory of Arizona. Also, he's based on a real dude. What we know today is Arizona almost became a sovereign state ruled by one James Rivas, truly one of history's most audacious con artists. Rivas found he had a talent for forging signatures during the Civil War writing himself and others furlough passes. Much later, he would apply his talent to constructing a fake land grant to a huge swath of territory stretching from Phoenix to New Mexico. He fabricated a family lineage of Spanish nobility culminating in an heiress, Sofia Peralta, and married her and even had portraits painted in addition to all of his meticulously forged documents proving her, by extension, his noble heritage and rightful claim to Arizona. Eventually, close study of his documents proved them to be forgeries, and he went to jail, and eventually died divorced and poor. The story of James Rivas was the inspiration for the Sam Fuller Western, The Baron of Arizona, starring Vincent Price. Why am I giving you a history lesson right now? Well, being the film nerds that Tarantino and Wagner are, the movie subsequently became the inspiration for Django Zorro's villain. The fictitious Archduke of Arizona wishes to build a railroad connecting the states of Texas and California, so that when Arizona eventually becomes a state, the government will be forced to buy the railroad from him. 
In order to build this railroad, Langdon will need investors like Dale Vega. What he won't need is paid labor, because he has enslaved the local native population to do all the work. It's this slave labor that has brought the attention of Zorro, and will eventually stir Django to rise to a greater purpose. Django Zorro works because it intelligently embraces the contrast between these two characters as well as their similarities. You know, kind of like what a great Batman and Superman world's finest crossover movie would look like. If somebody ever made one. Someday. Wagner called the crossover a dubious pairing, recognizing the differences between the old and the new, the sword with the gun, the masked with the unmasked. Their similarities bring them together, but it's their contrast that rub off on each other and inform their character arcs. For the aging Zorro, the well-to-do aristocratic dandy who was once the disguise De La Vega donned to fit in and fool the other muckety-mucks has ever increasingly become a part of his actual personality. He still knows how to kick ass, but he might also enjoy a nice cucumber sandwich afterwards. He's become a little lost in his own character. It's the rough and tumble, down and dirty Django that brings him back down to earth a little bit. For the much younger Django, teaming up with Zoro means he learns to broaden his scope of empathy. He's the hero in Unchained, but his focus is narrow. He has a mission, and he'll get dirty to accomplish that mission. If Flash said bad look at me again, I'll give you a reason not to like me. In a word, Django is no social justice warrior. Zoro, on the other hand, is the OG SJW. A Mexican Robin Hood, Zoro fights for the oppressed that can't fight for themselves, or inspires those that thought they couldn't. In this book, when Django sees what Zoro is, how De La Vega wields showmanship as an inspirational weapon, Django has the very same reaction he unintentionally inspired in the slaves around him in Unchained. I be damned. What has started as just another job becomes a mission of chain breaking. Django comes to look at these poor devils and see that there's a... Uh, Huh. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna read that, you can read it. The other reason Django Zora works so well is its structure as a Django Unchained sequel. It evokes Django Unchained in the front half in many ways, but diverges in the back half enough for it to forge its own identity. In the first issue, the first scene and first action set piece revolve around a horse-drawn carriage, just like Django Unchained. Later, Django and De La Vega roll into town, and De La Vega further reveals his martial prowess despite his gentlemanly demeanor, just like Schultz and the Sheriff. After that, Django accompanies De La Vega to the villain's estate as a guest, just like he did with Schultz to Candyland. The villain Lingdon has scores of hired men and slave labor at his beck and call, as well as a superiority complex to morally justify his subjugations, just like Candide. There's even a flashback scene between Django and Schultz that was actually a scene written by Tarantino for Unchained that didn't make it to the final film, in which Schultz bets Django that he can treat him to a steak dinner in the middle of Memphis, Tennessee. As a potential Django Unchained fan who has never read a Zorro story, all of this eases you into that world with things that are familiar so the story can do its own thing. <laughs> It's a rare and cool thing to create a character that's so big that it doesn't belong to you anymore. Zorro has clearly borne that out. And I think even Tarantino was at least hopeful that Django might have the same effect. It's a funny moment to see Django blow up Quentin Tarantino in the last 30 minutes of Unchained, but I believe that scene has more deliberate intent. The creation destroying his creator isn't an accident. Django is meant to live on his own, and so it's a pleasure to see that the character has legs in other creators' able hands. It's unlikely we will see Django return to the silver screen. But if that happened, they already have their story cracked. In fact, if anybody important is watching this, you should know that if Django does get a movie sequel, I will be profoundly disappointed if it doesn't co-star Diego De La Vega. If you enjoyed this video, please consider visiting our Patreon page, uh, see if there's anything there that strikes your fancy. And speaking of fancy, check out what Leonard Green got for his donation, huh? 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 Cool stuff like this, waiting you. Patreon.com slash alpha rookie. All right, see you next time.